Warm welcome to all of those that are here today and a welcome to you if you're watching online, wherever that might be in the world. We're excited that you took time out of your day. Maybe you have some friends that are watching with you on your computer screen or maybe you're watching on an airplane or somewhere. We're just glad that you took time out of your day to join us online as we are talking about courage throughout the month of July. As you know, every week we're using a different movie, and uh, this movie we have today for you, I, I think you're going to enjoy. Uh, but just before I get into that, I want to uh, ask you a quick question. Those of you online, you may be watching any parts of the world, and we could, we could if you told us your address, we could Google that and find that. But uh, for us here today, how many of you were born in a city outside of Vancouver? How many were, were born outside of Vancouver? Okay, well, let me do it this way. Was anybody born in Vancouver? Yay! Give them a hand. Come on, folks. We have a few that were actually born here in Vancouver. All right. Uh, I don't know if you've ever done this, but when Google Earth came out, I was so intrigued by Google Earth that I, I typed in my address and I wanted to find where I was on the map. Did anybody else do that? Did anybody else Googled where you lived? Uh, I'm going to show a quick clip. This is, this is where I grew up, and this is a quick Google Earth of, of my house. We're zooming in there west of the Rockies, close to the Montana border, close to Waterton Park. And if you Google in far enough and quick enough, you're going to find my home. That's where I grew up, southern Alberta. That's my house. And you could do the same for yourself. And if you're watching online, you could Google where you live. Today's message is about uh, a young boy in a small village in the middle of India. And uh, you could Google his place, I suppose, still today, and find it. The movie's called Lion. It's about a boy whose name is Saru. And uh, Saru, as a young boy, gets lost. He was set out with his brother to go working one night. He is on a train, and he's, he's lost, and 20 years later, at an, uh, his his home now in Australia. He starts to look for his, his home. So we're going to talk about that today. The first clip I want to show you is about his, his train ride. As I mentioned, his brother was off to work. He's only five, and his brother doesn't really want him to come to work because he, he's not strong enough. And he takes his brother's bike and lifts it up and shows, oh, I'm strong enough to go to work. So he goes to work with his brother. He's tired, so he lies down on the bench by the train station. Night comes, and uh, he wakes up in the middle of the night, and he can't find his brother. So he starts calling for his brother, and he wanders around. He wanders onto a train, and he begins to call for his brother. And uh, this is really the, one of the opening scenes of this movie, and I want to show it first, and then we'll go from there and talk about a lost boy who's found and how it parallels to our lives when we are lost and how God misses us and goes looking for us. So here's this first clip. In that clip, you can feel his panic. You can feel his fear. You can feel his anxiety. You feel all these emotions of, of being lost and being separated and being disconnected. He's disconnected from his brother. He's disconnected from his family. He doesn't know what's happening, and he can't get off this train. He travels on that train 1,500 kilometers. I'll show you a map where he travels from. He travels from a little city here in the heart of India all the way over to Calcutta. And he can't get off the train for that time. Two days as a five-year-old boy on this train. He's traveling and feels so alone and so isolated. And then when he gets to Calcutta, he gets off and he's... This little boy lost amongst all these people. And if you ever traveled to India, I've only traveled to India one time, but it is a busy place. The train stations are busy. To imagine a five-year-old boy in that place would be something else. Now, India has 23 official languages. He speaks Hindi. He lands in Calcutta where they're speaking Bengali. And he's in this train station. There's this great picture of him standing in the train station. And he's just so lost amongst the sea of people. He's an industrious young guy. He's, he's full of, actually for a young guy, he's got a lot of street smarts. He ends up spending three weeks surviving on the streets of Calcutta in the back alleys and streets. And he escapes human trafficking barely. And he ends up in an orphanage during this time. He finally finds his way to this orphanage. And uh, 
there he will eventually find his way to another home. But just as we experience that emotion of him screaming on the train, help me, help me, uh, it brought back a memory in my life where I was once lost just for a little while as a child. And uh, I was in our town of where we grew up near Pincher Creek, Alberta. And I don't know what happened, but I lost my mom and dad. And it wasn't for two days. It was only for maybe three hours. But I remembered the panicky feeling. I remembered the, <gasps> that w- was going on inside of me. It's like, what if I never find them? What if somebody kidnaps me? And I had all these thoughts were rushing through my head. I was so relieved when I saw my mom and dad. I remember crying as this little boy. And my dad said, well, we'd never leave you. Of course, we'd find you. And, and I was so relieved. And that was just for a few hours. And the horns honked and said, hallelujah. I was happy. <laughs> I was, I was so excited to find my dad. And I could only imagine what it would have been like if that was extended for days, for weeks, for months, for years to be separated from your family. Well, and you don't have to be lost physically to feel that way. That's not the only way you feel that. You can be lost different ways. You could be lost professionally. And you can feel the sense of panic and anxiety Oh, what's going to happen next? I thought this is going to be my career, and that's not turning out. What's going to happen to me? Am I going to make it? Am I going to have enough to retire? And you can have this kind of achy loss feeling professionally. You can have a, a loss feeling spiritually. I, don't, I feel so disconnected from God, from others. You can have that kind of a feeling spiritually. We can be spiritually lost. The Bible talks a lot about being spiritually lost. In Luke chapter 15, as a matter of fact, there's a whole chapter dedicated to the lost. We call it the lost and found chapter. Sheep get lost, coins get lost, and a boy gets lost. They all get found, that's the good news. So you'll be spiritually lost, and you can also be lost in relationships. Maybe you've gone through a breakup, or maybe through a divorce, or maybe separated from parents, abuse. It can be a relationship lostness, so to speak. So there's different ways that we can be lost. And no matter which way we're lost, the good news today is that God really cares about our lostness and our brokenness. And he reaches out in many ways to bring us back to a place of wholeness and ultimately back to him. And if we say, well, I I don't know if I, I feel lost. And even if we don't feel lost and we're found, there's a lot of lostness in our world today. This movie highlights India, and in India, just a couple quick stats for you, there are 80,000 children a year that go missing in India. 80,000 a year. There are 30 million children in India that are orphans. It's just one nation. There's 153 million children worldwide that are orphans. And there's 168 million children worldwide in child labor. Sadhu really was one of the privileged ones who ends up being adopted because only 2,500 out of 80,000 uh, or out of 30 million children, 2,500 a year are actually adopted into homes. So this story is a very unique, miraculous story that this young boy actually finds a home and then will eventually find his way back to his original home. It's quite a story. Which brings me to my first point, and, and that is this, that nothing separates us from God's love. See, this young Sadhu, he was not rejected. He wasn't abandoned. He was just lost. And we get lost for different reasons. Sometimes we're lost because of circumstances. We're lost because of a rebellion, or we're lost because different things have happened in our life. But he, he was never rejected by his mother. He was never abandoned. He was always loved. And the point being that God always has loved us. And as much as that love was like a magnet that drew him back there, we have this love that is from the Father that draws us back to him. There's a verse that I like in Romans chapter 8, and I won't take time to read all of it, just a couple of the verses there where it says, can anything separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? No, despite all these things, overwhelmingly, victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life. 
nor angels, nor demons, nor our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. Now, we have a story here that's amazing about human love, but there's something even greater, and that's God's amazing love for us. He has always loved us, even when we were, quote, unquote, lost, separated. He's always loved us, and nothing, my friend, can ever separate us from God's love. The second clip I want to show you is when he meets his adopted family, John and Sue Brealey. They're from Tasmania, Australia, and he has a, a brother as well that they've adopted named Mentosh. And he's a boy that has some, uh, he's more mentally troubled, that boy. And uh, they're, they've adopted these two boys. And here's a picture of him coming home to that family. And uh, his mom is played by Nicole Kidman. And uh, they, they've adopted him. And he's, as a five-year-old boy, lands in a new country. Everything's, of course, so different for him. He really doesn't know how to process it. He went from this orphanage, which re was really more like a prison. And because he had some wits about him, they saw something in him. He's, he's allowed and, and has one of the few that is actually adopted into another country. And uh, he grows up there. He's loved and he's, he's, he's well cared for and he wants to have a career. He go, wants to pursue hotel management. He goes off to school and as a young man is, is learning about that and meets other students. And because he's, he's Indian, they, they think that he's, he, he, he likes their food and he likes their, he's familiar with all of it. And, and he doesn't even really know where he came from. He, he'll tell people he's from Calcutta, but really he wasn't. He doesn't know where he's from. So it's quite a situation that he's in. And then they introduce him to Bollywood movies, introduce him to the food, and, uh, and he, he has trouble identifying as an Indian culturally. He's like, so there's this, there's this wrestling that goes with inside of him as, who am I? And not unlike a lot of others that have been adopted, he's wrestling with his identity. And that only will get stronger and stronger in, uh, in the next couple scenes of the movie as he, as he wrestles with, who am I? And uh, what am I supposed to be doing? His uh, identity of and wanting to be successful is now overcome by this sense of lostness, of, of who am I? He gets so obsessed with finding his first home that it creates friction between him and his, and his girlfriend. And in one scene, as he's wrestling through this, he, he's challenged by her, and, and she says to him, you know, you, you need to get a hold of reality here. And he's wrestling with this whole scenario of who, who am I in this scenario. And what, what's happening is there's a sense of, of lostness. There's this ache on the inside of him that he has to find his way home. So let's watch this next scene. We're fast forwarding from a boy to now he's in his 20s and he's been attending school. Hmm. And just like Saru is drawn like a magnet back to this home, back to his mom, his brother, his sister, he, there's something drawing him back. And he's in this state of almost, he almost torments him. Like, I have to get home. I have to be there. And, uh, but it was, it, it was love that was there. It was this sense of home that drew him. And, you know, there is a, a pull of God the Father's love on our heart. There, there's a quote that's somewhere in your notes. I put it in there uh, by C.S. Lewis. And C.S. Lewis says, uh, I think it's under your, your last point there. It says, if we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. And that's Saru at this place. It's like nothing can satisfy. There's something going on. I have to find my way back here. And it causes him to search for that which reminds me of uh, something we, we showed you uh, a couple months ago now. It's, it's a really a picture of, of what it means to repent. Sometimes repent gets, a, I think, a bad name. But I want to put up this little picture, and it really illustrates repentance. You'll see signs that say repent and burn, and it gives that, that word such a bad meaning. Perhaps you've see, seen that. I, I saw one the other day and on, a, on the side of a truck, repent and burn. I thought, oh, you, you're ruining the name, repent. It's a wonderful word. It's not a negative word in any way. And uh, in the middle of this picture, we have a candle which represents light, represents God as light, represents, represents his love. 
and uh, these all are people, and, and they're looking towards that light, and they're in the light because they're seeing it, and they, as a result, they also see one another. There's one individual who's, who's looking this direction, and he can't see the light, but he would see a shadow here. He'd know that there's light, but he, 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 he's not in fellowship with others, and he's not in fellowship with God. So repent, what repent means is to do a 180, and that's for him to turn and come over here. And when you simply turn, that's what, because that's what repent means. Repent means to turn towards the light, to make a 180. That's, that's what it means. It means a change of mind, or literally means to turn towards the light. So if I, if I do this 180 and turn over here, now I see the light, and I'm in fellowship, and I have the warmth, and I have the, all that light does, the color, everything's better because of it. And I have this relationship with God. But not only do I have a relationship with God, I have now relationship with other people. I'm not longer isolated. I'm no longer alone. I'm no longer living in, in the shadows. I'm living in fullness, in community. I'm living in light. And so this is what, this is what repentance means. It means to turn. Saru is isolated alone. He knows there's something more, and, he, and he's turning. He's, he's, something's pulling him. And we have a, a pull that comes from the Father. We want to turn towards Him. There's something inside of us that says there's a home, there's a love, there's a relation with God that's possible. And we, we hunger for that, just as Saru hungered to, to know his family. In Romans chapter 2, verse 4, there's a good verse that bears it out. It says, Or do you show contempt for the riches of His kindness, God's kindness, forbearance and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? What causes me to do this 180? What causes me to repent? What causes me to turn towards the light? What causes me to turn towards others? It's kindness. It's patience. It's His compassion. It's His mercy. It's His grace. Remember last week in our message, Les Mis, we talked about how grace comes before truth, mercy comes before truth. And before, in last week's movie, Jean Valjean, before he would experience truth, he experienced great mercy. What caused him to awaken and say, oh, my soul, what, what's happening? Mercy, truth, kindness caused him to turn towards God. And Likewise, what causes us to repent? What causes us to turn towards the light? What, what draws us home is God's mercy. What draws us home is God's kindness. It's His patience with us. God waits for us, and he, His love draws us home. And there was a love drawing Saru home. There's a love of God the Father that draws us likewise. Well, let me go to the next clip. There's a lot to cover in this movie, so I'm just going to take four of them here this, today. Uh, the fourth one, as he, as he continues in his struggle, Saru, he, he's not the happiest camper to be around. And, and when, you're, when you're in this process, it can be that way. He is encouraged by his girlfriend to contact his mother. As you can imagine, his adoptive mom, who, who loved him so much, was really struggling at this point. And so he was to go back and to visit her. He misunderstood her love for him. He had a brother, as I mentioned earlier, and that brother had challenges. He had, was trapped in an addiction. And so at one point in the movie, as he's in this kind of a low period of his life, he goes back to visit his mom. And he, and he, wants, to, he wants to get this right. He, he, he wants to know that he appreciates and loves her, and he, he needs to get some things in order as he's in this search to, to find his, his, his original home. So watch this next clip. That's a powerful clip in this movie where his mom says, we, we wanted you. We chose to have you. We could have had our own children, but we wanted you. And that point in his life, he... He begins to cry. He just realizes, wow, I didn't realize my mom loved me this much. I think sometimes we don't realize how much our Heavenly Father really loves us, how much He wants us. He says, well, He may want somebody else. He doesn't want me because I got a past. And I, if I got it all fixed up, maybe then God would want me. And God takes us with our past, with our brokenness. He, want, he accepts us the way we are. He, he wants us. I think that's one of the most powerful points in this movie. She kind of scolds him a bit for thinking that he's second class biologically some way because he wasn't her natural born child. And this point comes through so strong, so clear that God chose us, that he chose to adopt us. And just as 
that mom adopted him to love him. God adopted us to love us, saying, I want you. There's a powerful verse in Romans chapter 8, verse 15, where we read this. So you have not received a spirit that makes you uh, fearful slaves. Lostness, isolation is all rooted in, in, in fear. There's so much fear, so much anxiety. And again, it doesn't matter which way you're lost. When, you're, when you feel disconnected from whether it be your profession, whether it be your, your spirituality, your relationships, fear is involved with that. And you become a slave to fear. He said, and this is not what the Father wants for us. Instead, you receive God's Spirit when He adopted you as own children. Now we can call Him Abba Father, Daddy Father. So God has wanted to adopt us. He wants us to be part of the family. There's another great verse in Psalm 68, verse 6, where it says, God sets the lonely in families. And some of us, we we have great families, and some of us have been adopted into families, or some of us uh, were artificially adopted, but we're adopted into families. Uh, one of the men in our life group, Ken McAllister, Ken has an adopted son from Liberia, and uh, he was just here recently, and I was hoping to have a video clip actually ready of him. We interviewed them, and, uh, and Ken went to Liberia to help people there that were destitute and hurting and built really almost a town for them as a local businessman here and supports them. And out of that, he, he raised up one of the young men there, got him off to school and uh, got him an education. And, uh, and today, that young man is, is a leader in that nation. He was recently here in Canada, and he, and he adopted him. He says, now, it's not official adoption, but he's our adopted son. He calls me dad. So we have different ways that we're combined into our human families. But there's also the spiritual family that we get to be adopted into. And that lasts for all eternity. This, this family's here now, but there's, a, there's a family that lasts for all eternity. And what a privilege to be adopted into, into God's family, where we're brothers and sisters together. I have a friend who landed in the airport today. He's from Nepal, and I'm looking forward to visit with him this weekend. And he's a pastor there. And Brother D.K. Daniels is his name. And, and uh, they've done so much work with the, with the girls that have ended up in slavery there in Nepal and the children that have been taken there and has such a heart for them and his heart for that nation to see that nation made whole. But he, he, he's, a, he's a brother to me, and yet he's from Nepal. We, this family of God is so powerful. We get adopted into this wonderful big family. We can all call him our father. Well, let me get to this uh, last clip that I want to show you today. He gets to work in his war room, I'd call it a war room, and he puts up on the map, Saru, on the wall here, all these different places that uh, he thinks his village might be. And he discovers Google Earth, and that's about the time Google Earth comes out. And so for not a month, not a year, but for six years, uh, Saru would, every night, he would look at Google Earth. He'd, he'd follow every train track, and he'd, he'd try to find, where is my home? And he said, I remember the water tower. I remember the three stations where the train was. And I, I remember this and that. He had these memories that were waking up of what he had as a five-year-old. So can you imagine? This is a needle in a haystack. There's 1.6 billion people in the country. There's a lot of villages in India. And every night, he, he calculated how far would a train go in that year that was there. I went, and he begins by a long process. Finally, after six years, one, two o'clock in one morning, he says, ah, this is it. There is a train station. There's the water tower. There, this is where I, I am. He's so excited. He texts his, his adopted parents. They thought they won the lottery. He won his girlfriend's house. I found my home. He's, he's really excited as he's done all this work to put it together. And uh, then he would go and he would make the journey back. 25 years later, he lands in the little village where he grew up. This is a true story. It's such an amazing story. Uh, you, you Google it, you'll find all kinds of documentaries, documentaries on it. And he, he lands in his little town, and he, by instinct, he, he walks down the streets. He said, I had muscle memory. I could remember the streets. And he's wondering, is my mom going to be there? Is my brother going to be there? Did they move? And he has all these thoughts going through his head, and he, and he walks into this opening, and where his house is, was, it's, it's no longer there. And he's like, oh, I came all this way. Is this the way it's going to end? After all this time looking for my home, is this the way it's going to end? And he turns around and he's carrying with him a little picture that he had 
as a five-year-old boy taken of him when he was at the orphanage. And he asks the man there, I'm Saru, I used to live here. The man happens to speak English. And he shows him the picture. And the man says, wait here. And he waits. And after he waits, this is what happens next. Wow. Last, last picture is a picture of his adoptive mom taken there when they did an interview, 60 Minutes, and uh, he was able to introduce his two moms together. What a powerful ending to that story. Now, did you notice something? That uh, when she found her son, how a whole village came out, and they were all cheering. You know, it reminds me of a parable of the lost sheep where Jesus said, What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? When he found it, he lays it on his shoulder, rejoicing. And he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents, and again, repents is a good word, who turned toward the light and towards others, than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. And that last clip is so powerful because you just see these people gathering around. They're so excited that Saru has found her lost son. And as much as, you know, Saru was there coming home. His mother was waiting. You know, God also waits for us. God's waiting. He's waiting for us to respond to him. He's waiting for us to awaken to the fact that he cares for us, that he loves us. He's waiting for us, so to speak, to want to come home. And say, God, I want you in my life. God's patient. He waits for us. There's a verse that says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, the Lord isn't slow about keeping his promises, as some people think he is. In fact, God is patient. God's waiting because he wants everyone to turn from sin and no one to be lost. When I, when I see the, the tears and the joy of this mother, I can't think about the joy of the father, the joy of others. Just say, yes, they've turned, they've come, they've come home. They've recognized that there's a God who loves them and they've responded to that. And so... Today, our time's gone by very quickly as we've gone through these different cliffs, but you might be here today and you've never responded to that. Maybe you're, maybe you're watching online and uh, you felt so distant, but God has not overlooked. He's not forgotten you. You're not forsaken. And today is the day where he's just drawing you to come home. And you could just say, Lord, I'm coming home. I'm, I want to be with you. I want to know you. So I'm going to pray with you today if you're watching online here today. Let's just take a moment to pray. You could be here and this, I don't know how you are watching today, or I don't know what would have caused you to come in today, but God has not forgotten you. And this is a day to just say, Father, I'm coming home. I want to, I want to embrace your love. I want to respond to what you have done for me. And, and just allow him to put his arms around you today to receive his love. His, his adoption is waiting there for you. So let's pray together. We'll pray here and we can pray online together. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, today I receive your love. I respond to what you did for me when you died for my sins and rose again that I could have life, that I could have a home with you. I respond to that today and I receive it in Jesus' name. Amen.